This is a Silver Bullet Security Podcast with Gary McGraw. I'm your host, Gary McGraw, CTO of Sigital and author of Software Security. This podcast series is co-sponsored by Sigital and IEEE Security and Privacy Magazine. For more, see www.computer.org slash security and www.sigital.com slash silver bullet. This is the 121st in a series of interviews with security gurus, and I have a real guru here with me today, Marty Hellman. Hi, Marty. Hi, how you doing? I'm good. Martin E. Hellman, a.k.a. Marty, is Professor Emeritus of Electrical Engineering at Stanford. Professor Hellman worked at IBM Watson and MIT before returning to Stanford in 1971. He holds a BE from NYU and an MS and PhD from Stanford, hence the return, both in electrical engineering. Marty's best known for his invention with Diffie and Merkel of public key cryptography. He's also been a longtime contributor to the computer privacy debate and was a key player in the first crypto wars, which we're going to talk about later. Marty's won too many awards to mention, but I will mention the most recent one, which was the 2015 Turing Award, sometimes called the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. Marty and his wife, Dorothy, are very active in nuclear nonproliferation and peace issues and are writing a book about that now. They live in Stanford's Palo Alto campus. Their granddaughters, Zoe and Celeste, are now in college, and grandson Max plays the bassoon. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Actually, I need to mention then daughters, uh, Sonia and Gretchen, <laughs> and the therapist, <laughs> otherwise they'll get upset. Oh, it's okay uh, to skip a generation, I think. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> Sonia's a therapist, also working on making the world a better place, working with people. And uh, Gretchen is uh, worked in information security and uh, Uh, is now uh, combining that with coaching. Oh, very nice. So I want to focus our conversation on two things today, your work in cryptography and your work in nuclear nonproliferation and risk management. So let's start with crypto and move on to the second topic later. What got you interested in crypto in the mid-60s? Can you tell us the story of how David Kahn's book and Horst Fagel's ideas and Claude Shannon's brilliance caught your attention? Sure. Uh, It's always fun to remember that. So um, when uh, my, the first when I left Stanford in '68 and went to IBM Research for a year, two things happened. I went to my first information theory symposium, and that was the area I had done my PhD thesis in, information theory. And the uh, the banquet speaker uh, that year, January 1969, was David Kahn, a uh, great historian of cryptography. He had just finished a couple years before his uh, bestseller book, The Code Breakers. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> that certainly put the idea in my head. And also, when I was working at IBM that year, I was in the same department with Horst Feistel, that's F-E-I-S-T-E-L, who is widely regarded as the father of IBM's cryptographic research effort that led to the data encryption standard and really formed a foundation on which uh, Witt and Ralph and I and others, uh, R- Ravesh Mir Adelman, uh, all built. And I was in the same department with Horst, <clears throat> And so while um, I didn't work on cryptography, um, I was exposed to it. Mm -hmm. It was floating around in the air. (laughs) Yes, and also IBM was spending good money on it, which uh, reinforced my belief that there was a commercial market for encryption when when it didn't seem that way in 68, 69 to almost anyone else. Mm -hmm. And then I went to MIT in 71 as an assistant professor. I'm sorry, 69 to 71 uh, for two years as an assistant professor. And Peter Elias uh, now passed on who was one of the original contributors to information theory, worked with Claude Shannon, showed me Shannon's uh, little-known at that time 1949 paper relating information theory and cryptography. Yeah, fantastic. And I realized, I'm an information theorist, maybe I can do cryptography. So those (laughs) were the three key events. Yeah, that's great. Um, And I guess when you really started working on it, there, there were countervailing winds, one might say. Yeah, well, actually, at first, IBM uh, was given a pretty free hand by NSA. Feistel had had worked on government crypto and had clearances, and I, IBM also had huge contracts with NSA. Sure. So they cleared everything with them. And at first, there was a pretty uh, openness, but uh, I think it was 1974 when Witt and I both independently showed up uh, at Yorktown Heights, IBM Yorktown, uh, a secrecy order had descended on them, and so and that was the beginning of the uh, ill winds, as you call them. Yeah, or countervailing winds, I suppose. <laughs> well, countervailing, and then when there was a threat to throw me in jail, we regarded them as ill. <laughs> Let's get into that in a minute. So when did you connect up with Witt and Ralph? Well, let's see. Witt first. Uh, 
So uh, I, sometime probably the summer of 74, spring 74, I, I was at Yorktown talking with Alan Conheim and others. Uh, Conheim headed the math department, which where cryptography was, and uh, he's now at Santa Barbara. And um, when I was there, I mean, I'd visited there several times before, but this time they were a little more mum. They just had the secrecy order to send on them. Management was trying to get them to work on operating system security. They felt that cryptography had been solved. There was nothing more to do. Wow. And so they, they said, we can't tell you much, and also we're being encouraged to work on other things. So I left, but Witt showed up probably a couple of months later, and Conheim told him roughly the same thing, but one additional thing. He said, you know, Marty Hellman was here uh, a little while ago, saying roughly the same things. When you get back out to Stanford, because Witt had worked here at the AI lab, yeah, mm-hmm. you ought to look him up. So it was in the fall of 1974 that uh, Witt uh, called me, and I set up a very short, maybe half hour at most hour meeting that ended 11 o'clock that night. <laughs> you know, that's time. exactly what Witt said in an earlier episode of Silver Bullet. We talked to him a few episodes ago. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a fantastic meeting. I mean, uh, uh, I've been working in isolation, and while I'm a uh, I kind of revel in doing things against the, the grain. It uh-huh. was nice to find someone else finally who, who saw things somewhat the way I did, uh, pretty much. Ralph was somewhat later, Ralph Merkel. He was an undergraduate and then a master's student at Berkeley, and he proposed uh, the key distribution part, not the digital signature part right. of um, uh, public key cryptography, and actually did it a little before Witt and me, but independently. We didn't know of his work. And one of Witt's friends uh, put us in touch, and again, uh, I could just see Ralph's brilliance and, and appreciated what he was working on. So when he finished his master's, I brought him to Stanford to do his Ph.D. There's a neat little story with that. Can I? You, I'll oh, please, yeah, absolutely. That's what this is for. When I mentioned to Ralph that I'd like him to, you know, if he wanted to, I'd love to have him come do his Ph.D. At, under me at Stanford, because no one at Berkeley appreciated what he was doing. <laughs> uh, in fact, he has a copy of the CS244 uh, project proposal, uh, he was taking, which he dropped out of after this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the professor wrote on it, he proposed developing public key cryptography as project one and something much more mundane as project two. Yeah, and he said project two sounds more interesting. <laughs> yeah, but he also said, perhaps because your description of, pro- of project one is so muddled. And admittedly, it was so outside the mainstream of thought, and Ralph was young, uh, I'll forgive the professor. Wow. So, Anyway, I said, said to Ralph, well, you know, if you'd like to come do your PhD here, I'd love to have you. And he said, but I can't afford it. And I explained to him that the research assistantship I'd give him at Stanford would give him the same stipend he got at Berkeley yeah. uh, as a TA, and the tuition would be paid for by the uh, uh, research assistantship. So that's how Ralph came to Stanford. Well, that's a great work. story, yeah. Um, you know, like-minded people come together eventually, usually. Um, mm-hmm. So tell us about the first crypto wars. What were they about, and how did we win? And let's do that, and let's cover the clipper chip fight at the same time, which is sort of the second crypto wars, but right. everybody gets them all mushed together in their minds. But, and now we're in the third. Yeah. yeah so, uh, you only want me to talk about how we won, not how we lost, because we also lost. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you both. You can talk about both, how you won and okay. lost simultaneously. In March 1975, so about six months after Witt showed up and and started working with me here at Stanford, and I don't think we yet knew about Ralph, uh, we knew the National Bureau of Standards, now NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, was going to come out with a proposed encryption standard for commercial use. Mm -hmm. This is what's now called the Data Encryption Standard. March 75, they put in the Federal Register a proposal for this Data Encryption Standard, or DES, and Witt and I had been anxiously awaiting the announcement. We looked at it and quickly realized that the 56-bit key size was at best marginal and uh, potentially disastrous. Yep, and yep. With Moore's Law and the passage of time would, be, in fact, be totally inadequate. Yep. So we initially thought this was a mistake, and uh, we wrote letters. Actually, uh, Witt po- uh, we, we wrote le- uh, letters to NBS pointing out the problem, and to which they didn't really respond. <laughs> and so, Those letters somehow never arrived. <laughs> well, you know, we, we were naive enough to think they actually wanted comments on it. We didn't realize, as I now do, that once something's in the Federal Register as a proposed standard, it's, it's really over. a yeah. standard. Yeah. And uh, after about four or five months, and certainly by six months, uh, I realized we had a political fight on our hands, not a technical fight, and Mm. it was becoming clearer, and now it's extremely clear, that the reduced key size was NSA's doing. Yep. Uh, And that's been admitted. Uh, Yeah, and and you know, that even Triple Des and the Triple Des cracker that was built years later by Kotcher showed how right you guys were, theoretically. 
Right, although that, that deep crack, as that machine was called, yeah. uh, only broke single des, not triple des. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought it was triple yeah. des. No, no. Triple des would, is, pr- is probably still okay, uh, but, but single des, would, would, then that's the thing. There was an easy way to make it better by, by tripling it, but that increased the, the cost by a factor of three. They could have done the same thing just by increasing the key size. Right, right. Uh, so anyway... Um, when we when we made it when we realized we had a political fight and actually started to fight it as a political fight, getting we got David Kahn to write an op-ed in the New York Times uh, on this uh, after he checked us out, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Gina Colotta covered it at Science Magazine somewhat after that, and it really started to hit the fan. Uh, so the first element of the first crypto war was DES key size, with NBS and really NSA speaking through NBS, saying that the key size was adequate for the purposes for which the standard was intended, Right. which we disagreed with, because you might protect hundreds of millions of dollars worth of data yep. with it. Yep. Uh, you know, we're seeing things like that today. Um, I guess the, the same philosophy of, well, we have this capability now and we're going to go dark was what was driving that. Poor right, that's tactic. getting into the third. Right, that's the third, current third crypto war, uh, which I'll get to in a second. So that was the first element was the key size issue. The second element was when we, especially after we developed public key cryptography, soon after that, uh, where suddenly you could uh, change your keys uh, every minute if you wanted to, right. because key distribution before that involved sending registered letters, couriers, very expensive uh, process. Whereas pu- uh, public key cryptography allows you to do it uh, over. The Internet. I yeah, mean, an open channel. That, yep. Right. It, it sounds impossible, but it does work. And so you could change keys much more frequently, and that made DES's 56-bit key size, which was, by the way, there's different ways to look at it. We saw 56 bits as too small. The people in communications uh, intelligence, signals intelligence within NSA who are listening in on foreign powers and mm-hmm. terrorists and things like that, mm-hmm. they saw 56, as bit, as way, 56 bits as way too much. Hmm. Because think about it, if everything prior to that was, uh, most everything was unencrypted, they could search, even in those days, millions or billions of words for a dollar looking for key words. Right. Once you have even a small barrier, even if it costs a dollar to break, uh, to get a key, that's a huge increase in cost. Absolutely. It changes the economics. Right. And so the... So the first crypto war was about two things, the key size of DES and the freedom for us to publish our papers, both on key size of DES and uh, public key cryptography. And, NSA, you were, and they, they threatened to jail you over that work? Well, NSA never – well, we have, especially in those days, NSA always talked in code. Everybody talked in code. <laughs> That's in fact, right. That's talk, when they didn't really exist still. <laughs> right. No, uh, no, no such agency, yeah. never say anything. Yeah. But it was also the IEEE. When the IEEE got the threatening letter from a guy who worked at NSA, written from his home address with no indication he worked <laughs> at NSA, but we, Witt was able to verify that he did. Right. Uh, so he sends a letter to the IEEE as a concerned IEEE member that saying, you know, it bothers me that the IEEE is breaking the law by publishing papers in certain areas. He never said exactly what. He never mentions me by name, but right. he listed like six journal issues and i had a paper in every one but one yeah and so that's code in itself yep secondly the ieee and they i'm sorry but they were using the itar justification right right international traffic and arms regulations it's illegal to export an f uh 16 without a license obviously it's illegal to export the plans without an export license and anything cryptographic was regarded as an implement of war so by publishing our papers the his position was that we were violating the international traffic and arms regulations, and I forget whether it was five or ten years in jail that he cited as the um, uh, as the punishment. Yeah, you know the the thought of you and also wit as arms dealers is a, is somewhat <laughs> ironic. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so anyway, uh, when the IEEE responded to him, they copied me, but they didn't copy me as Martin Hellman troublemaker, which you know. Uh, they used code, too. They sent it to me because I was on the board of governors of the um, Information Theory Group, which ah. had published several of the papers. But they didn't send it to all the governors. So that's what I mean, that people tend to talk in code. Right. That was the first crypto war. Yep. And you, and you, just, you, you got past that by just doing it, right? Well, two things. The, the, we lost the key size. DES stated 56 bits. I mean, we proposed triple DES, and that was used by some, uh, a lot of people. But a lot of people didn't. 
So yep. we really lost on the key size until AES, the current advanced encryption yes. standard, came out about 15 years when ago. When I got started in this stuff, um, in, in using applied cryptography, we were using triple DES on smart cards at the time. This was... We lost the key size issue in t- in t- until later. Uh, and also, but we did win in the long run on that because not only did the key size go up in AES, they adopted it in the way we said DES should have been adopted, mm-hmm. a transparent, open adoption process with critiques and, and not just uh, the algorithm coming uh, uh, full blo- you know, full blown from the brow of Zeus. Yeah, speak. so 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 that's good. But then later they made a step backwards. You know, when they put out crappy elliptic curves to oh, use well, in the ECC. Well, Step backward from our point of view, forward from their point of view. <laughs> but the thing we did win on was the freedom to publish. Right. Uh, uh, so we won that battle. And you did that by presenting a paper at Cornell, um, I guess, in lieu or instead of your students who had done some of the work because you were in a better position to take the heat. Yeah. Well, well when I got this letter from uh, J.A. Meyer, was the guy's name, at, uh, who wrote to the IEEE, I took it to Stanford's general counsel for two reasons. Uh, the IEEE responded, they're well aware of the ITAR, but they always regarded it as the author's and the author's institution's responsibility to make sure they weren't in violation. Right. So I had to, you know, Stanford was potentially liable, plus if I was prosecuted, I wanted to make sure I had Stanford's uh, financial backing, because that can bankrupt you to, to defend yourself. Yeah, no doubt. And so I had a, a meeting with uh, John Schwartz, was Stanford's general counsel, and I gave him, you know, we had one meeting, and then he said, let me review it came back a few days or a week later and he said uh, i'll never forget this conversation he said it's my legal opinion that if the itar are construed broadly enough to cover a publication of your papers it's unconstitutional Mm. but he said i've got to warn you the only way to settle this is in a court case and if you're so if you're prosecuted we will defend you if you're convicted we'll appeal but again i've got to warn you if all appeals are exhausted uh we can't go to jail for you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, that you know, it's a real act of bravery to do what you did, seriously. And well, it's important for people to realize that sometimes you have to stick with your principles. Yeah, it's funny. It's uh, I have a friend who a, was a Marine captain uh, during uh, uh, the Iraq War, and you know, he, people were, I, I was corresponding with him as he was going on deployment, and he said, people keep telling me how brave I am. He said, I just signed up for Naval ROTC so I didn't have to pay tuition. <laughs> And I said, I understand, because a lot of people tell me I was courageous, you know, brave or whatever to do this. But, you know, I just kind of fell into it. Yeah, that's great. (laughs) I mean, you know, once once NBS and NSA are lying to you, as they were uh, at that point, and they're, you know, they're starting a fight with me from my perspective, although I imagine they saw it the other way. um, It just was a natural thing. I couldn't let it drop. So let's talk about Clipper Chip really briefly, and then the current, your view of the current crypto war. Okay, Clipper. So it was Clipper Chip and Key Escrow, of which Clipper Chip was an instance, uh, were in the mid '90s. Yep. And the idea here is that uh, every telephone that has encryption, every uh, computer that has encryption, will have a master key built into it that allows. If you get the master key, you can get any session key, any key used for a you know, conversation, for right. example. And the master keys would be escrowed, stored by an escrow authority under careful lock and key. But if there was a court order, then the master key would be given to the FBI or a local law enforcement or NSA so they could listen in. And we know how well the government stores records, OPM. Well, that is a problem. <clears throat> yeah, Office of Personnel Management is an example. <laughs> so, um, and there was a big fight over this. This was the second crypto war. And... Um, Congress actually, it wasn't solely about that, but it, uh, Congress, a large part of a National Research Council committee charge from Congress uh, concerned this, and I served on that in the mid-90s. Mm-hmm. And we had a former Attorney General, Benjamin Civiletti, representing the FBI and law enforcement's interests. We had Ann Cara Christie, uh, former Deputy Director of NSA, representing uh, their interests. And we reached unanimous conclusion. Was Brian uh, Snow on that panel or not? No, he was not. Uh-huh. <clears throat> And um, one of the big issues was key escrow and corporate chip, and uh, we just couldn't see how to make it work. And so in our final report called Crisis, Cryptography's Role in Securing Information Society, which is freely available online on the National Research Council's uh, website. As all their we, publications are, yeah. Right, we, in PDF. 
we recommended that the government experiment with key escrow for its own purposes, and if it could figure out how to solve the problems that we couldn't see how to solve, we didn't necessarily say all of this, that then they come back to us, and they never did. Yeah, yeah. And one of the problems is, who holds the keys internationally? Of course, yeah. I and, mean, there's no there's no ultimate jurisdiction today, really. Right. And so, as you pointed out, uh, it creates a huge target, you know, this uh, this database of, of master keys, even if you could solve the first problem. Absolutely. I mean, building yourself an Achilles heel on purpose. Exactly. And the third crypto war, which we're now, is very similar, and it's almost a repeat of the second. It's almost like people forgot what happened 20 years it ago. It is truly amazing to me, because I was around during the second crypto war, and, <laughs> you know, it's like it never happened. Right. And so... Um, I signed on to, uh, now the Apple case has been dropped, but uh, I did sign on to an amicus curiae brief, a friend of the court brief that EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, yep. uh, put together uh, backing Apple's position. And I have an op-ed in The Hill, uh, which is a kind of D.C.-centric uh, uh, newsletter, with um, Ron Rivest, who everybody listening to this will know, the leader of MIT's cryptographic effort that revolutionized cryptography, me, the, Stanford, the leader of Stanford's group that did the same. So we have the two key people from that era. Mm -hmm. And then we had the two technical PhDs in Congress. Uh, Jerry McNearney's a mathematician, and um, uh, Bill Foster's a physicist. Uh, the four of us wrote an op-ed, um, uh, which you can find um, uh, online, and arguing that this, hey, this is like a repeat of the second crypto war, and, uh, and we need to be, get smarter. We'll be right back after this message. If you like what you're hearing on Silver Bullet, make sure to check out my other projects on DarryMcGraw.com. There you can find writings, videos, and even original music. So, you know, today the WhatsApp people decided to add end-to-end -end crypto to their um, product set, and they turned it on. So there are two billion more crypto users starting ah. today. Yeah, well, this is one of the things, like Diane Feinstein's my senator, and she's on the uh, Intelligence Committee. And oh, she's getting ready to introduce a bill, which is going to be a mess, I'm sure. Yeah, and I like her on most things, but this one she's she's wrong on. I mean, you can't repeal mathematics. You can't repeal. I mean, if you make it illegal for the um, manufacturers like Apple, then there will be app manu uh, app developers. Absolutely, it. it's you know genie's out of the bottle. So it's even further out now that two billion more people are using in in crypto. Um, so let's kind of you know end up this section of the talk. Congrats on your recent Turing Award, by the way. That's just fantastic. We're all thank you. We're all very proud, and I was surprised that you hadn't gotten it yet, <laughs> as I told you at Paul's thing. So, would you mind telling the story about when the ACM called you up and you learned you'd won? Because I love that. It's a very charming story. So let's see. I'm an electrical engineer rather than a computer scientist, although there's obviously a lot of overlap. And so when the uh, I got the call from the ACM. Um, must have been, uh, let's see, it was late, very late February, just a few days before the announcement was made. We sped it up because of the RSA conference. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they told me I'd won the ACM Turing Award. Congratulations. And I was very pleased. I knew it was their top award. But uh, I didn't realize that there was a million dollars connected with it, and maybe partly because that was only last year. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, it was, it was, you know, this was very nice, but my wife and I are, uh, kind of half joking about what we're going to do with another plaque. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the plaque closet's my, full. <laughs> well, actually, I'm in my study and I've got them kind of stacked up on my <laughs> next to my bookcase over there. I can see some of them because uh, there's just not enough wall space. I and, love it. Uh, uh, so, but the next day, um, the, I'm talking to one of the public relations guys at Stanford, and they're making a big deal of this, uh, bigger than I would have expected. And he says to me, he says, "Amadi, he's uh, Australian." So, so uh, this may sound crass, but uh, you're going to be asked this. What are you going to do with all the money? And I say, what money? <laughs> and then I find out Google has made this a million-dollar prize. Yeah. <laughs> and that was, I go in and talk with my wife about it, and very quickly we decided this came at a great time, both the publicity and the money, to uh, uh, help push our, our book uh, that we're working on. Uh, on um, reducing the divorce rate, ending needless wars, and getting rid of the nuclear threat. So. Yeah, that's a perfect segue. So let's talk about that for a while. Um, 
You know, nuclear nonproliferation, or as you deftly put it, reducing nuclear risk to acceptable letter, uh, levels. Level. Um, you know, what got you started working on that issue? Oh, very simple. 1980, uh, my wife, Dorothy, a three-word answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we'd been married in 67, uh, 1967, so this was 13 years into our marriage. Two kids, a house that we couldn't afford for quite a while, uh, normal life. We, our marriage, what, we didn't know it at that time because we didn't take time to look at it, but our marriage was in trouble. And uh, Dorothy had enough intuitive sense to be looking for catalysts and uh, she was working at uh, Touche Ross, now Deloitte Touche, as an auditor, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, one of the partners was involved in this crazy organization from our then point of view, which was concerned with environmental degradation, and mm-hmm. and uh, he invited Dorothy and me to a weekend seminar on the bigger issues of life, and the group always worked at two levels. The, uh, the macro level was initially the environment. The micro level has always been, if you're married, making peace in your marriage. Hmm. If you don't have it already, and I know very few people who do. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, when Reagan became president, uh, the <clears throat> and we realized the in, b- the greatest environmental threat of all was a nuclear war. <laughs> yeah, that kind of screws focus. up the planet for a few thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, a few million, maybe forever, yes. <laughs> And then as we researched the problem, and it was a very unusual group, uh, people would kind of call it a peace group, but it was something different. Uh, uh, it was a human potential, human growth group, because the real problem is that our technology has outpaced, our, our technological progress has outpaced our uh, maturation as a species. You know, I problems. totally agree with that, and I think that the pace of technology, especially technology adoption, has moved to be even quicker in the last hundred years. It's sort of shockingly fast for us <clears throat> right. as a species. Absolutely. And so the problem isn't nuclear weapons or uh, genetic engineering or artificial intelligence potentially 20 years out. Uh, the real problem is the chasm between that godlike physical power through technology and our at best irresponsible adolescent behavior as a species. <laughs> and so the bad news is if we don't grow up, we're going to destroy ourselves. The good news is we have to grow up. Right. And we'll stop making a lot of mistakes. We'll stop getting into the needless wars. We will uh, uh, deal with the environment, take a long-term uh, perspective. So that, that's how I got involved. Tell, tell us your TNT vest analogy. I think that's a oh. really apt analogy. Yeah, so almost nobody's concerned with nuclear weapons these days. <clears throat> you know, that's, they think of it as the problem of the past. But there are still about 15,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Uh, we've got about six or 7,000 in this country alone. And uh, But people act as if there's no risk. But the way I put it is, imagine a guy wearing a TNT vest were to walk into the room where you are now. and uh, But you knew he wasn't a suicide bomber, so he says, nothing to worry about. Um I don't have the button for setting this off. There are two buttons in very safe hands, so there's nothing to worry about. One's in D.C. with President Obama, and one's in Moscow with President Putin. So just sit down and relax. You would get out of... oh, oh, by the way, there are buttons in Paris and London and Beijing and Pyongyang, and the terrorists are trying to get one. But don't worry, just sit here. Yeah. We'd still get out of that room as fast as we could. I believe so. so. What I say in this analogy is why, just because we can't see the weapons uh, controlled by the those buttons, the real buttons, uh, why have we as a species, as a society, sat here complacently assuming for so for decades that just because the Earth's explosive vest has not yet gone off, it never will. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit about the <clears throat> risk of nuclear terrorism. Do you think that that is changing recently? Well, certainly over the last 20 years, it's become much, much greater. Uh, and uh, I think it's a combination of terrorists realizing they could do that. Uh, but the risk of nuclear war is actually the greater risk, contrary to what the president has said, contrary to what Colin Powell has said. Mm-hmm. There's a very simple argument. The nuclear war would kill at least a billion people, okay, 10 to the ninth. A nuclear terrorist incident would kill at most 10 to the fifth, right. 100,000. Right. That ratio is 10,000 to one. Now, so nuclear war is, 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 could only be the lesser risk if it is 10,000 times less likely or more, you know, 10,000 times or more or less likely than nuclear terrorism, and that just seems unlikely. Yeah, mathematically speaking, most people don't think of risk in terms of math, which is strange, but they don't. Right. And actually, the elevator pitch for this is, um, <clears throat> uh, as we call it in Silicon Valley, 
even if we could expect nuclear deterrence uh, threatening to destroy civilization in an effort to um, preserve the peace, even if we could expect that to work for 500 years before it failed and we destroyed ourselves, which seems optimistic, by the way, <laughs> that that's equivalent to playing Russian roulette, Russian roulette with the life of a newborn child. It's like one because, in ten, right? Well, one in, well, in Russian roulette, the risk is one in six. Yeah. And one sixth of 500 years is uh, about 83 years, that child's rough ex- roughly expected lifetime. Mm-hmm. So why are we not looking at this? And I've been trying, in fact, I was on a call this morning with a senator's uh, aide to try to get uh, Congress to authorize a um, National Research Council study, and nobody's very interested. I mean, there are co- some people in Congress interested, but it's impossible to get anything through. Yeah, yeah. Well, our political system is in a, in a quagmire currently. So let's talk about the book that you're writing with Dorothy now. The title is A New Map for Relationships, Creating True Love at Home and Peace on the Planet. What's the book about? You know, why are you writing it? How's it coming along? And so on. Sure. First, a plug. If you go to nuclearrisk.wordpress.com or go to my Stanford webpage and look for blog and you'll find I have some blog posts on it. There'll be a link associated with this issue when we uh, put it Okay. So why are we writing it? Uh, there are a number, a couple of reasons. One reason is uh, almost no one's interested in nuclear weapons or war and peace. I mean, they express mild interest, but no one really gets involved, and they feel it's like too big an issue. What can, what difference can I make as well? Mm-hmm. Whereas if the first step uh, to solving those problems is to produce greater peace in our marriages and other relationships, who but you can take that step? And that's how it worked for us. Uh, we worked on both problems at the same time. We reached a point where we have not had a single fight in 10 or 15 years. Now, I didn't think that was possible. I have to give Dorothy credit for that vision. And it was, all, it was a 20-year process to go from fighting all the time, in my perspective, <laughs> to right. fighting, to never fighting. I mean, we had to learn a lot of things. Yeah. But working on both the global uh, threats and the and the, the the insanity in the fights we got into in our marriage, the same fights over and over again, uh, actually speeded up both processes. Uh, so 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 uh, so the personal is informing your views of the international. Is that and vice versa and vice versa. Yeah. So for example, well, who's the it, North Korea of your marriage? <laughs> neither of us, thank <laughs> God. Otherwise, we'd be divorced or, or one of us would be dead. But, <laughs> You know, North Korea, as as horrible and despicable as that regime is, when it comes to nuclear weapons agreements, nuclear agreements, they actually have a good track record, contrary to what the press tells you. Oh, and that's this interesting. Comes, this comes not just for, and again, on my blog, I've got a lot of coverage of that, uh, and giving hard facts. Um, Sig Hecker, who's the former director of Los Alamos mm-hmm. for over a decade and a colleague and friend of mine now, I rely heavily on things he's written and... Uh, um, uh, lectures he's given, and he says these things. He's been to North Korea seven times on track to diplomacy. Hmm. The easy way to summarize that, at the end of a guest lecture he gave about four years ago in a seminar I was teaching on uh, nuclear weapons, risk, and hope, mm-hmm. he gave a guest lecture on North Korea, and at the end of the lecture, a student asked him, you know, Professor Hecker, it sounds like from what you've told us today, like North Korea would have absolutely no weapons today, no nuclear weapons, if President Bush hadn't done what he did in 2002. That was the logical consequence of, of what he told us. Uh, I mean, we don't know for sure because you can't go and you know, do parallel universes. No, it's a counterfactual, but it's a, it's worth thinking about. Yeah, and the, the one little piece of evidence I'll throw out: North Korea had a um, a reactor that would have made ten bombs worth of plutonium a year, and it was only a, a year or two away from completion in 1994 when the agreed framework was signed, mm-hmm. and they. As part of the agreed framework, they stopped construction of that reactor. Yeah. And it started to get so badly rusted that the last time Hecker was in North Korea in 2010, he saw them dismantling it with cranes because it was going to fall down. Right, right. So they, it's bad that they have nuclear weapons today, but they'd have over 100 if it weren't for the agreed framework, and they'd probably have none if, we, if President Bush hadn't thrown out the agreed framework. I think that's worth talking about. You know, the, these frameworks like SALT and SALT Two and the things that – we worked on with the Russians during the Cold War actually worked. And, you know, the the agreement that we just put in place with the Iranians is very similar in nature. Absolutely. 
So yeah, so actually, I, I'm, I, I found out I was one of the nation's top 29 nuclear uh, weapons experts when the New York Times called me that. <laughs> well, what congratulations was, on that, too. Yeah, well, I, and I am probably the world's expert on nuclear risk because almost no one else works on it. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Uh, Dick Garwin, who is one of the world's top nuclear weapons experts, he, um, Edward Teller credited him with being the key. Isn't he the uh, guy who just retired yesterday or last week? Oh, I didn't. I haven't seen that. He may have. But, yeah, uh, it, there was a big piece on him in the Post, which was great, and it and it talked about his work in all the frameworks. Yeah. So, and he was one of the key people that made the first H bomb work. Uh, but he, unlike Teller, he then worked on arms control. Uh, hmm. And uh, uh, Dick Garwin, who I admire and 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 trust, uh, Fermi, who was his PhD advisor, called him uh, the one true genius he ever met. Wow, <laughs> that's yeah. that's not faint praise. <laughs> no, and I've, I've heard similar things from other people. I mean, Dick is just amazing. Anyway, he asked me if I'd sign this uh, letter uh, in support of the nu- Iran nuclear agreement. I agreed with it uh, when I read it. I trust uh, I trust him, yeah. and so I signed it. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so you really have to look at the alternative to this agreement. Yeah. Well, uh, let's, maybe, go ahead. Let, let's. I want to. I want to turn this slightly broader towards all the listeners here and ask you about technologists and engineers, not to mention software developers, and some notion of an ethical background or an understandings of, of the philosophy of the things that they're building. Do you, don't you think that's something that we're not doing a very good job teaching these days? I, would, I absolutely agree. And it's a very hard thing to teach. Uh, I, ha- I have a section in the book called The Devil on My Shoulder, uh-huh. And it's when I was trying to decide whether to go public with DES key size controversy. Right. You know, uh, two guys from NSA flew out and told me, you're wrong, but please shut up. If you keep talking <laughs> this way, you're going to cause grave harm to national security. Right. This was just before we went public. And I sat down, I think it was that night, to figure out the right thing to do. Yeah. And the idea popped into my head, forget about what's right and wrong, run with it, you've got a tiger by the tail. Yeah. And at the time, I thought I dealt with that uh, devil on my shoulder, so to speak, and concluded that the right thing to do was to go public. But when I watched a, a, a documentary day after Trinity about the Manhattan Project, yeah, the people who worked on that project were asked, what was your motivation? They all said Nazi Germany. If Hitler got the bomb first, it would be horrible. Right. And then they're asked later, so when Germany was defeated and Japan was our only adversary, uh, why did you keep working? Yeah. And they don't know. Watching that video... Momentum. Been, not just momentum. They, I think they fooled themselves. I realized I had fooled myself. I thought I dealt with the devil on my shoulder. Yeah. But I, I had done what I think they did and what I think most people do. They figured out what they wanted to do, which was to work on this project. Yep. Uh, and they had socially acceptable reasons that they could admit, like Hitler, and socially unacceptable reasons that they hid even from their own conscious mind. Mm-hmm. Is my brain powerful enough to destroy a city? Could I be the war hero and have the girls fall at my feet instead of that football quarterback guy? Right, right. Uh, and I had similar things, you know, with the DES, and I vowed watching that film that I would never do that. I would never fool myself again. I had not caused the same kind of damage as they, but I could see where I could have. Yeah, and, and I think that that's something that's worth some conversations in school when people who build our modern systems have to grapple with these things. Actually, they don't have to grapple with these things, and they ought to have to grapple with these things. Right, and I think it needs to be done with case studies like the one I just gave you. Yeah. Because it happened later, maybe five or ten years later, RSA Data Security wasn't paying us royalties on Stanford's patent, and so they ended up selling their company for $250 million, and we made almost nothing on our patents. Yep. And... um, Someone came to me, uh, uh, well, a guy his name is Lou Morris, uh, the president of Silink uh, at the time, came to me and said, um, you help me get an exclusive license to Stanford's patents and we'll get those RSA bastards by the ball. <laughs> he, he spoke to me. He's a little scrappy Jewish guy from yeah. Philadelphia. <laughs> and I didn't want to go with Silink if it was for revenge because I'd made this vow I wouldn't fool myself. Right. But I was so pissed at them at the time that I couldn't... Uh, be sure I wasn't fooling myself. Right, right, right. I went to...